So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a limited amount of time, so I'm going to leave bios aside and we're gonna jump into content as quickly as we can so that we can make the most of our 25 minutes. Um, David and Nat, I, I trust you don't mind when we go straight for it and see where we get. So I'm joined by these two leaders. We're gonna start with five minutes of comments each, first starting with David on China's net zero transition plan, and then going over to Nat to speak about the Biden administration's plan for the US to reduce emissions. After these remarks, we'll go into a brief discussion. And if you have questions, please go ahead and submit them through the audience Q&A button, because we will be reserving time to make sure that we integrate your questions into this discussion. So with that, David, I'm handing it straight over to you. Well, thanks, Melissa, and congratulations, Bruce, congratulations, Usher, congratulations, Jeff Yale, and everyone at Columbia Business School for this really impressive and interesting conference. Uh, so let's talk about China and greenhouse gas emissions and start with just the basics. Uh, China leads the world by far in greenhouse gas emissions. Last year, somewhere between 28 and 30 percent of global emissions came from China. That's more than the US, European Union, and Japan combined. There, there's no solution to climate change without China. And if I had to summarize Chinese climate change policy in one sentence, it would be Chinese climate policy is a study in contrasts. There are a number of world leading and very impressive steps that the Chinese government is taking to address climate change. On the other hand, there are some very dangerous trends in China as well. So let me enumerate each of those in just a few minutes. Um, to start in terms of leadership, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping last fall announced that China would uh, get to net um, zero or, or car uh, carbon neutrality by 2060, a uh, hugely ambitious goal for China, um, first major developing country to make an announcement like that, galvanize world attention and really makes a difference for the world leading emitter to say that they're gonna convert their economy to net zero by 2060. Uh, in addition, China, leads the world by far in renewable energy deployment. It's done that for, for many years. Last year, there were 72 gigawatts of new wind power uh, deployed in China. That's about four times the United States and 48, 48 gigawatts of new solar, which is about three times what the United States deployed. Uh, China leads the world in electric vehicle deployment by far. Uh, more than half the electric vehicles the world sold last year were in China. China, this is more controversial, but China leads the world in nuclear power by far. Of course, nuclear power is a zero carbon energy source. Um, uh, building a nuclear power plant instead of a coal fire, coal fire power plant does a lot of good from a global warming standpoint. Uh, China has the largest emissions trading program in the world. It's been quite slow to launch, but it is launching now We're in the power sector, uh, plans to launch it elsewhere. Um, uh, and then just in recent breaking news, Chinese government has announced in the past couple of weeks plans to reduce uh, excess capacity in its steel sector, steel manufacturing sector, which makes a big difference. And then finally, on my list of, of good things about what's happening in China, I'd highlight there are no climate deniers or there are no known climate deniers in the Chinese government. Big contrast with the United States, right, where we've got large parts of the political system that have denied the very underlying kind of global consensus on climate change. So all of that's wonderful uh, and is really important to fighting climate change. On the other hand, uh, and cannot emphasize enough, uh, China has continued a massive buildup of coal power. In its, uh, and uh, last year, 38 gigawatts of new coal fire power plants were brought online in China that seen different statistics that somewhere between half and two thirds of all the new coal fire power plant brought, brought online in the world. Um, new approvals continue in China. Uh, and these power plants are gonna be around for decades and um, fundamentally threaten our ability to hit the goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, in some ways, you know, e even worse for compounding the problem, China continues to finance coal-fired power plant construction abroad as recently as in the past month. There have been celebrations, uh, announcements of new coal-fired power plants financed by Chinese entities abroad. Um, there are only two governments in the world right now that continue to do that, the Chinese government and the Japanese government. The Japanese government uh, appears to be in discussions about whether or not this policy will continue. Um, uh, very threatening to overall uh, climate goals. And then the recent 14 five-year plan, which was the first stage of that was announced in China last month. Um, it's, a, it's really a year long process. The first stage was announced, really de-emphasizes climate change, I think, and um, green issues in general, and puts energy security at a kind of much higher 
priority. Um, and there are a number of ways in which energy security does align with climate change goals, but a number of ways in which it doesn't. So to sum it up, China incredibly important from a climate change standpoint um, uh, to the world, no solution without China. And I would describe Chinese climate policy as a study in contrast. No, David, I really appreciate that contextualization around it. I mean, looking at the contrast, because there's a lot to celebrate if you're looking at mitigation, but also a lot of risk. Um, and I know you and I speak about that with our colleagues at the center. I mean, this is at the forefront of our discussions pretty much every day, like where are the opportunities and risks? So I appreciate all those comments. Um, Nat, I'm gonna speak, uh, pass it over to you to bring us back to the US for a moment. Give us some catches for that. Okay, well, thanks, thanks, Melissa. And thanks to the Tamer Center for this great discussion. Uh, I think it's a natural uh, compliment to talk to uh, to David's focus on China, of course, because the other country that we can't do without if we're going to solve or address climate change is the U.S. Uh, as probably most listeners know, the U.S. now the second largest uh, emitter globally, although it's been vastly overtaken by China, as David mentioned. But together, they still are about forty percent of global emissions. Uh, and But the US remains the largest historical emitter and of course the largest economy in the world. So I think there is no solution without the US. And of course we've seen in the US a complete sea change since last November when the Donald, the Donald Trump uh, pulled us officially, pulled the US out of the Paris Agreement on the day after the election, November 4th. Of course, the first thing that President Biden did when he came back in was uh, when he entered office was to re-enter the Paris Agreement. So I wanna talk a little bit about the target that President Biden laid out. Uh, Hero mentioned it briefly on the way. And then I want to talk about how, uh, after a little bit of context, I want to talk about how the U.S. can meet that. Um, I'll start with the target. And, you know, I always say that uh, re-entering the Paris Agreement was one of those rare day one actions that uh, President Biden actually took on day one. He literally, the afternoon of January 20th, um, one of the few things he was able to do in that, well, he did a lot on that first day, but he only had an afternoon, and yet one of the things he did was re-enter the Paris Agreement. But that was only the beginning. And what we saw a couple of weeks ago was the next really important step, which was the announcement of the U.S. Nationally Determined Contribution, or NDC. To put that in context, everybody else, uh, all the other countries of the world are actually also coming back and uh, upping their nationally determined contributions, again, as Hiro mentioned, because we're five years plus one, but we allow the one for the COVID crisis. We're basically five years after the Paris Agreement. And so this was already the time when countries needed to come back and up their ambition. But of course, with the US, we're re-entering. And so there were a lot of eyes on the administration. Uh, and I think people, I, I for one was pleasantly surprised that President Biden announced the target of cutting emissions 50 to 52% below 2005 levels, which is near the US peak. 52, 50 to 52% below by 2030. It was a really strong show of ambition. That puts the US essentially in the top tier, um, not quite as ambitious as the European Union and not nearly as ambitious as the UK, but right up there in terms of the top tier of ambition. And the US was also, by doing that, able to pull a couple of other countries along. Canada was more ambitious than expected. Japan, uh, as well as Hiro mentioned, there are still many other uh, countries we'll need to see setting their targets, but I think the US setting the lead like, or taking the lead like that will be really helpful. So now how does the, you know, what's next? How does the US do it? Well, the first thing I wanna point out is we have a new dynamic here because of the Paris Agreement. And frankly, this is something that folks who were contributing to the architecture of the Paris Agreement, were hoping we would see this dynamic, which is the pressure internationally to set a high target has led the US to set a real stretch goal and now that's gonna be the bar that the US has to meet. And so this is a case of international pressure, ideally driving domestic action. President Biden, of course, made climate a priority, but he's gonna to have to keep making it a priority because that 50 to 52% is a really, really ambitious goal. It's achievable. We did a lot of analysis at EDF, a lot of others did. The, I always say, we did the math, we know how to achieve it, but it's gonna require a lot. Here's what it'll take. First of all, by sector, that's one way to think about it. The most important sectors in terms of US emissions reductions, first, the power sector, there is no way to meet that 50 to 52% target without deep emissions cuts in the power sector. Uh, probably around 80% cut below 2005 levels. We're about 40% now. That's going to require legislation. Uh, that's going to require, in particular, something like a clean electricity standard that can put an enforceable limit on that pollution. And then 
provide the flexibility to meet it. Uh, transportation sector is another really important aspect uh, or a, a emitter, not quite as big uh, a source of emissions reductions in the next decade, but critical to meeting the president's goal of net zero emissions by 2050. And if we're gonna meet that by 2050, we need to get started now because of the long turnover of fleets and the time it takes to develop new technologies. And if we start now, and in particular, put the transportation sector on, a, on, a, on the path to zero emitting vehicle sales, 100% zero emitting vehicle sales by 2035 for cars and 2040 for trucks, um, that will also be a big chunk of emissions reductions, even by 2030. But we're seeing, you know, EPA has the authority to do that with tailpipe emissions, and we're seeing car companies like GM and Ford respond. The third sector that will be really important is methane from oil and gas. Uh, again, the audience may be familiar. Methane operates on a different time scale as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide lasts in the in atmosphere for centuries. It essentially sets the long-term temperature of the planet, vital that we decarbonize the economy so that we have a hope of stabilizing the climate at safe or reasonably safe levels. Methane is a much more potent warm, warmer over the next couple of decades. And it's really the only way we have to slow the warming in the next decade or two. So cutting methane from oil and gas emissions, one of the largest sources of, of human caused methane, that's going to be a really important uh, tool as well to meeting that really ambitious target for 2030. Um, I, where I'll end, and I know we'll talk more about this, the infrastructure bill this year will be the first critical test. It is vital that climate and clean energy be central to that package. That's part of what the president has announced, but we have to see it remain a priority as Congress starts to take up deliberations. That's not sufficient, but it's a necessary first step. Thanks, Nat. I really appreciate those comments. Um, there's so many threads that I could possibly pull, but we're going to try to focus in on a few of them. Um, certainly appreciate your comments about the power sector and it leading this overall decarbonization effort and enabling the decarbonization of other sectors like transport. Um, so I want to step into one question that actually deals with both of the countries that y'all just highlighted, which is looking really about this tension between cooperation and competition at the high level. So when I look at the degree of effort that is needed to mitigate climate change, to protect our health, to get anywhere close to this target, the targets that we've set out in Paris, a lot needs to be done. A lot needs to be done very quickly. We've got to cooperate, or at least I don't see a different path that we could take. But at the same time, we've got that competition edge within all this. So it seems like there's a lot of tension in these relationships as well. How do you see this dynamic really playing out here in the next few years as we move you know, into Glasgow, but through it. And we say, we have these goals. Now we need to put rubber to the road as it were and actually achieve them. How do you see that tension playing out? David, I'll go to you first. And then Nat, if you wanted to comment as well. Really important question, Melissa, thank you. And I'll just start in the context of the US-China relationship in particular. And as the basic background here, as I think a lot of people will know, the US-China relationship is in a very difficult state right now. It's really more difficult than any time in a half a century, any time since normalization of relations began um, in, the, in the early 1970s. Uh, the distrust between the two company, between the two countries is, is very, very high. Now, there, there is a interesting background and a long background of cooperation between the US and China on environment and climate change issues. In fact, dating back to the late 70s when formal relations were normalized. Some of our first cooperation between the US and China was in science and technology issues um, that continued for decades. And then kind of most famously in the context of climate change, in 2014, President Barack Obama and President Xi Jinping entered into a bilateral agreement on climate change, which got headlines around the world and which many observers, I, I think correctly, consider to be a key foundation for the Paris Agreement. So US, US-China cooperation, these issues have been really important. I think it's going to be very difficult in the years ahead to do this in light of the uh, distrust and discord between the two countries. And not, not impossible. Uh, Secretary Kerry, Special Climate Envoy for President Biden, was in Shanghai a couple of weeks ago um, and entered into a bilateral agreement with his counterpart, Minister Xie Jinhua, about how the two countries would cooperate on climate change. I think that's an encouraging sign. I think actually operationalizing that agreement is going to be very difficult. Intellectual property challenges are going to be hard on any type of technology cooperation. Uh, there are going to be political issues. Um, so I, I just think it's going to be really hard. To, uh, I think cooperation is desirable. I think we've demonstrated cooperation can help. I don't think cooperation is actually essential. I mean, 
um, uh, in, in to make uh, progress on climate change. I mean, there was obviously no cooperation between the U.S. and climate change between the U.S. and China on climate change for the four years of the Trump administration. You know, zero, and the world moved forward on climate change during those years. You know, I, I think uh, some amount of cooperation, some amount of competition, um, I, I think could work. The, the world could move forward, and you know, for example. You know, by, by, by more or less by coincidence, roughly 9% of electricity generation in each country last year came from solar and wind combined. I mean, I, maybe we could start a competition. Who's going to have more solar and wind power competition each year? You know, kind of a, a trophy for who does that. And, you know, th that's kind of a game type thing. But, but I, you know, market competition, I think, could also help um, to advance it. So I'm all, for I'm all for cooperation. I think we've demonstrated that can really make a difference. If cooperation doesn't work, maybe competition can help us address the climate change problem as well. So I'll just add a couple of points. I, I agree with basically everything David said. Um, but, so one, I'll just reinforce, I think competition, not necessarily a bad thing, if what we're talking about is competition on climate and clean energy, and especially on sort of clean energy economy. I mean, losing <laughs> we you know people often talk about competitiveness and sometimes it's over it, it it's often a political rhetoric but there is a reality to it and clearly losing the real global competition to china would be a terrible thing for the us and i think the biden administration realizes that so for example if we converted to electric vehicles but all of those vehicles were made in china and we lost the automotive sector in the us that would be terrible i, I don't think that's going to happen in large part because uh, or in, in part because I think the Biden administration sees the need alongside policies to get us to more electric vehicles. It sees the need to promote domestic supply chains and manufacturing that can ensure that that automotive supply chain stays here and then grows. So I don't. I think that sort of the the idea of competition can be motivating. I think it, it it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but I I do want to highlight one area where um, where you know to build on what David said. I think the most important sphere potentially for cooperation, or at least not for destructive competition, is going to be in other countries. Um, we heard about, about, David referred to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, that's the massive trillion dollar plus initiative, infrastructure initiative in China. Whether China pursues a greener Belt and Road, which President Xi made some suggestions about doing in, in his speech at the Leaders Summit, or whether it continues to, produce, to sort of follow sort of a browner Belt and Road, meaning um, the conventional coal-fired energy and coal-fired power plants of the kind David talked about. That's one of the biggest forks in the road for the world. And I do think that some form of cooperation uh, encouraging China to follow a greener path and perhaps getting the U.S. back in the game of uh, influencing and financing green development around the world as a nudge, I think that will be a critical part of the path. But domestic cooperation on domestic policy I think, as David suggested, it's actually much less important than it was uh, eight years ago or, or seven years ago. No, I think there's a lot of great points. Um, speaking of leadership, I do want to pivot to the Leader Summit on climate. Uh, just if we could talk about that for a minute or two here as time runs short. Um, as we all know, President Biden brought together 40 world leaders, and, and David, you mentioned it, you know, and I you mentioned it as well, really looking at climate change and putting it at the forefront of at least US and I would say global foreign policy discussions. What are the key things that we should take away? If you had a couple of bullet points uh, for those who saw pieces of it, maybe not all of it, what are the key things we should be taking away? And should it leave us optimistic, pessimistic or somewhere in between? I'll go to Nat first and then over to David. Sure, two, so two quick bullet points. One is I think a lot of what the US administration was doing from January 20th right up to uh, April 22nd, the Leaders Climate Summit, still remains kind of below the surface. In other words, some of that was, there were some places like China, uh, sorry, Canada and Japan where the diplomacy was able to pay off and we saw uh, a new leader level announcement, but there were, there were other countries like Korea, which said, well, we're gonna come back to you later with our new uh, target, but also especially China and India where there's much more work that needs to be done. I think there has been progress below the surface, but that's where we only saw a piece of what we're gonna see. And we need to see much more progress by the Glasgow COP that Hero referenced in, at the end of the year. So that's the first bullet point, good progress, but more to be seen as to bear fruit from the efforts. The second point is in addition to the leaders announcements and so on, there was also a fair amount done uh, from the private sector. All these leader summits often provide a platform for new announcements. There were announcements around the global financial alliance to net zero. 
Uh, there was a big announcement that EDF was behind around a billion dollar public private coalition to mobilize uh, finance for tropical forest protection in a way that's not been done before. And there were other public private commitments as well. So including on sustainable aviation biofuels. So it, there were, the big headline was the US commitment, but there were also lots of other things that came out of that summit that we'll need to watch going forward. I totally agree with Matt's great points and, um, and with Matt's great points and, and uh, maybe three three observations. Uh, first, I think the main takeaway was the U.S. is back in the fight. You know, the, the U.S. retreated from the battlefield and climate change for four years, but the U.S. is back. Second, the U.S. president has remarkable convening power. You know, th that office has both powers and limitations, but it's just striking to me to see the U.S. president calls a meeting and who shows up, you know, the leaders of 40 countries with more than 80% of the global economy's GDP with you know the, the world's largest financial institutions, uh, the world's largest businesses, the world's richest people and biggest, philanthrop you know, biggest philanthropies. I mean, it's remarkable what a US president can achieve by calling a meeting, I think, and it brought forward announcements of the type that Nat was just uh, highlighting. Um, a third observation, striking to me how climate change has moved to the center of foreign policy. And this is a big change from when I first started working on this issue decades ago. I mean, right, a hundred days into the U.S. president's first term, no foreign policy issue has gotten remotely the public attention um, that climate change has. And, and this just, I think, it's very encouraging in terms of long-term solutions to the problem. Yeah, thank you both. And I'm going to transition just into some questions from the audience and. I'm gonna to try to group them together and paraphrase a bit. So if you asked a question and I didn't quite capture the spirit, I'll just apologize in advance and we'll do our best here. And thank you for everyone who submitted questions. Um, Nat, the first ones are really focusing in on some of the comments you have made about infrastructure and the need you know, to direct infrastructure dollars in the near term to go into a greener future instead of a browner you know, continuation of what we've been doing. So two kind of pieces to this question if I'm reading it right, uh, from Frank and Diane and others. So what do you mean when you talk about what needs to be done between now and 2030 when it comes to infrastructure, if we wanna be on the path to 2050 to these net zero targets? And then the second component of that is, you know, will the US, do we think, lean into carbon taxation, clean electricity standards, or what other tools to actually help us get there and move those dollars in the longer term? Sure, so first on the infrastructure piece, I, I wanna be clear, I think that's, as I said, sort of a necessary but not sufficient condition. And so. It is the first big test because that's right in front of us. It's politically, it's the politically salient piece right now, right? The US economy still emerging from COVID. I think prognosis is pretty good. If they, you read Paul Krugman's column this morning, and I think the, the prognosis of a booming economy coming forward are pretty good, but still an opportunity to get people back to work and to use the opportunity to highlight climate and clean energy. The issue is, if you get not to get too far into the political weeds, but there's a tension here and a balance here between um, getting some uh, uh, the, the the possibility of getting some bipartisan support, at least in the Senate, where there are still some folks who are willing to to, to deal, um, at, versus getting a bigger package, that, but going really only with Democratic support through the reconciliation process. I think um, what we you know there was some hope for a massive big push of an infrastructure package that included a trillion dollars. If you look at what, what Biden has put forward, the American Jobs Plan and the American Family Plan, about $4 trillion in spending, about $1 trillion of that, give or take, is on climate and clean energy. So I think it's vital that whatever path they take, whether they push through one massive package through reconciliation just with the Democrats, or whether they try to do first do something like a surface transportation bill with Republicans, and then maybe push the rest through reconciliation, it's really important that the, whatever gets passed this year does include significant in, in spending in modernizing the grid, transmission, um, vehicle electrification, the kind of investments in domestic supply chains that I talked about. Those are really important as well as mass transit and energy efficiency and other investments that will reduce energy use and, and so on. So that's, got, that's vital and, and what will be a failure is if they just pass a conventional highway transportation bill and call it a day uh, without major climate and clean energy provisions. Um, so that's the major piece on, on infrastructure. Um, I briefly, look, I'm an economist. I've worked on carbon pricing and market-based approaches all, you know, all, my, all my career. I would love for this not to be the case, but it is unlikely that we're gonna see a carbon price, it, like comprehensive carbon pricing legislation this year. It's not impossible 
that it's unlikely because the president said he's going to pay for these things with other taxes. Um, there is a possibility of something like a clean electricity standard, but the political window is narrow. You either have to figure out how to get that done in reconciliation, which is challenging if you really want, but it's not impossible, but you got to figure out how to do that with an enforceable limit if you really want it to be effective. Or you need to figure out how to get 10 Republicans on board. Not impossible, but a pretty heavy lift at this point. Thanks for that, Nat. Um, David, I'm going to give you the last word, if you don't mind. And broadly, there's a question, uh, and I think it brings together a lot of them, that says, is China's contrast and approach working or not? And what can we learn from it? And that's a tough I, order for one minute, but I'm going to ask it <laughs> anyway. I would have a hard time saying it's working at this time. I think there are promising and encouraging signs, some of which I detailed in my opening comments about long-term goal, uh, strong commitment to renewables, electric vehicles, other clean energy technologies, but the coal build continues in China. Um, uh, emissions continue to increase um, and the short-term trends are not nearly as encouraging as the long-term goals. So I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, and it's a big ocean liner that's turning, but uh, be hard pressed to say it's working yet. Well, thank you both David and Matt. Really great to see you both and appreciate this conversation. And thanks again to Bruce and all the organizers for your efforts putting together these discussions. Fascinating conversation. Just wish we had another hour or three. <laughs> so thanks guys.